Good morning, church. Uh, Chase said, my name is David Baxley. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Bethany. It is good. Good to see you here this morning. Uh, I am curious, how many of you have seen the game show, Let's Make a Deal? I'm just curious, how many of you guys have seen it? Okay, so a lot more than I actually thought may have seen it. it. One of the weird things about that show is that when you look out into the audience, everybody is wearing a costume like an extreme costume. Like you look out there and it looks like a, like a crazy Halloween party. And I, I never knew why they did that. So I looked it up. And what I found is actually when the show started, nobody did that. And then a few people started doing it because the way the show works is they pull contestants out of the audience for the chance to win prizes. And so some people started doing it just to get the attention of people that were choosing so that maybe they would come down. And now everybody wears these crazy costumes because everybody wants a chance to get the prize. And so what happens is a contestant is brought down and, and they talk to him a little bit, but when they bring him down, they give them, they give them a prize. It's nothing major, major or significant, or overly big, but still something of, of value, maybe like an iPad or a computer or even some cash, like $700 or something like that. But then they're presented with an offer. They can keep the prize that they've been given or they can take it and they can give it up for what's behind the curtain. But then here's the catch. They don't know what's behind the curtain. So behind the curtain could absolutely be like one of those amazing prizes, like a trip to Hawaii or a car that is of immeasurable value compared to what they have. But what also could be behind there is what the show calls a zonk, a prize of ridiculously low value, not even worth the time. And so then they're presented with a choice. Do they give up what they have of, of, of some value for the potential of what's behind the curtain of great value? And this is what the Christian life is like. See, the Christian life is when God gives us that opportunity to forsake maybe what we have that, that we may find valuable and, and might have some value. But he offers us a chance to give it up for the sake of something that is immeasurably better if we're willing to give it up for him. And this summer, even though now we're in the fall, we've been in a series throughout the whole summer on parables. And we have just two weeks left this week and next week we'll be looking at a couple of parables before a new series starting up. So just a reminder for us what a parable is. A parable is a short, engaging story meant to illustrate something important to God. And each week, really, as we've been going through these parables, one of the things that I think jumped out to us that in order to understand the parable, we need to understand the world, the culture that, that the people hearing the parable have been living in. It helps us understand what they heard and what Jesus was saying. And, and so one of the big differences between our world and the world of this ancient Middle East culture was in this world, everything about the life of the people centered around kingdoms. Everything centered around the kingdoms that they were a part of. And, and it wasn't just the kingdoms, it was a very militarized, intense culture to the point that even while Jesus would have probably been teaching these parables, there probably would have been soldiers out among the people or on the streets that he would have been teaching, walking the streets just to make sure that the people of that city or that town that are part of that kingdom maintained their allegiance to the kingdom that they are under. And what, what that tells us is that, the, unlike maybe our world today, people were defined, their existence was defined by the kingdom's that they were a part of. They didn't exist, though, just to serve the kingdom. Really, the people exist to serve the king. Whatever the king said, whatever the king wanted, that was the purpose of the people. And this can be really foreign to us 
Because although we're used to national borders and, and, and nations, and we even understand this idea of citizens, what we, what we don't have to think about, what we don't think about in our world today is the idea of us being loyal subjects to a particular leader. In fact, what we do is we just, we just take leaders and we vote them in and out of office based on what we think needs to happen, based off who we think will be the best leader to represent our best interest. And so living in the world, that we, in our country, the way we live in, we're not even familiar with this idea of having to determine how we live our lives based on the whims or desires of a president or a, a king. But the people of Jesus' time hearing this message were absolutely in, living in a world where the kingdoms they were in and the king that they served ruled their existence. And so this morning, we're going to come to one of several parables in Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus is beginning to talk about the kingdom of heaven. So we turn with me, Matthew chapter 13. And as I said, this is one of many. We're just going to look at one of the parables in this section, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look, get down to the end of it near uh, at verse 44. And let's just look at this parable together. Here's what Jesus says. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and he went and he bought it. And this theme that we see jumping out in this parable, the kingdom of heaven, he says it twice, the kingdom of heaven is like, it, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew alone over 50 times. And it's still echoed throughout the rest of the gospels, the stories about the lives and teaching of Jesus. And so what we realize is we, as we begin to read the gospels and we look at the, the teachings of Jesus, we see a theme, the kingdom of heaven, or some books call it the kingdom of God, same thing, dominates the story of Jesus because it's the reason Jesus came to earth. The kingdom of God was at the center of everything Jesus was coming to do. And so if we want to better understand this parable, this focus on the kingdom of heaven, we need to understand what Jesus was talking about when he spoke of this kingdom. And so the, the story of the kingdom of heaven, it actually goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. It goes all the way back to creation in the book of Genesis. Because the word heaven is meant to remind us that this is a kingdom that is not a part of this world. It didn't come out of this world. It exists separate from the world that we live in. It's, a part, it's, it's separate. It's set apart. It's not like it. It's different. But in the beginning of Genesis, what we see is God is painting a picture for us through creation where God's kingdom is coming into the world that he creates in that moment. And the kingdom of heaven is united with our world. And God creates a perfect kingdom on earth. He, he created a perfect kingdom with no pain and no sadness, no anger, no conflict, no death, no suffering. And, and not only that, he's the king that lives in intimate, close relationship with, with his subjects, with his creation where he loves them so deeply and, and passionately and, and he walks with them and he talks with them and he, 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 he experiences life with them because he wants to be near them. And then you have his creation that responds to that love and loves him back that they want to exist to serve the king. Because this is a place of peace and joy and contentment. It's a perfect kingdom. But see, God's creation rebelled against their king when Adam and Eve decided they would do what they wanted instead of what their king wanted. And that was when sin entered the world. And what began with Adam and Eve is, is still continuing in our lives today. And so in their sinful rebellion, they rejected their king and they chose to rule their own lives. They decided to establish their own kingdom. They decided to make themselves their own kings. And the Bible describes the contrast between these two kingdoms. He describes these kingdoms that we create as the kingdoms of this world, 
reminding us how they are separate from the kingdom of heaven. But the moment that humanity rebelled against God, God began to institute his plan to establish his kingdom with his creation to reunite us with our king. God saw the results of sin. He saw the pain that was happening in these earthly kingdoms. He saw the the suffering. He saw the devastation, the destruction, the hurt, and the sadness. All all these things that we see and we experience, we we know what, what, what he's talking about. And he looks and he sees this and he said, this is not what they were created for. This is not what I wanted for my creation. And so God desired to liberate, to rescue his people out of the kingdoms of of this world by offering them a chance to enter the kingdom that they were originally created for, the kingdom of heaven. This is why Jesus came to earth. This is why God became flesh and lived among his creation was so that they could see him bring the kingdom of God to earth. It was God's divine intervention because it was his divine invitation to them to show them a kingdom they have never conceived of. Something that they were divinely created for. That's the kingdom Jesus is talking about when we read this parable that we're reading this morning. And so even as we begin to understand a little bit, just a little bit of what the kingdom is, what comes along with that is we not only need to know what it is, we need to know how do we find the kingdom? How can I experience the kingdom that that God is wanting me to experience with him, to be reunited? And this was a question that Jesus was asked as well. In Luke chapter 17, Luke tells us the story where someone came and asked this of Jesus. This is what it said. And when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, see here or there. For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus is saying, guys, the kingdom's not an event, and it's not a place you're going to go. Instead, the kingdom of God is, is, exists here in the person and the presence of Jesus. And so we find the kingdom of, of heaven when we experience the presence of Jesus in our lives. And we, we begin to experience the presence of Jesus in our lives when we're willing to let Jesus, when we make him king over our lives, when we let him reign in his rightful place. And we can even see this in the last word that Jesus says in this, in this description in verse 21. One of the ways this word can be translated at the end is to actually say, for you see, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Because we find the kingdom of God as we say yes to the invitation that Jesus is offering us for him to enter into our lives, to establish himself as king, as our ruler, and to shift our allegiance to following him. But this requires something from us to move from one kingdom to the other. This is, this is why Jesus worded it the way he did in this parable. Go back and let's look at that parable one more time. Look what Jesus said. He said, the kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had, and he bought it. Jesus is telling us the kingdom of heaven is so valuable. It's worth anything and everything you would have to give up to be a part of it. But unlike that game show, there is no risk Whatever that thing is that we have, he's saying is insignificant compared to what is behind the curtain. If you would just be willing to let go and have it. And so really practically, just what we're being asked to do is we're being asked to give up the things that just keep us from being able to live in the kingdom of God. 
what we're really being asked to do is give up the things that keep us from being able to walk in relationship and intimacy and closeness with Jesus the way he originally created us to do all the way back in Genesis, all the way back in the Garden of Eden. But he's reminding us the kingdom does have a cost. We have to give up the kingdoms of this world, give up the kingdoms of the world we live in in order to experience God's kingdom. But the, the problem is not necessarily the, the nations of this world. It's not necessarily like these, these political kingdoms that we, we, we find ourselves living in. That's not necessarily the big problem. In fact, I would say the bigger obstacle, the biggest problem for us is actually the kingdoms that we build for ourselves. It's my kingdom, the kingdom I want for me. So my kingdom, it it, it represents this idea. My kingdom represents the foundation I've created for my life, shaping it to align with my desires, ensuring I experience what I want out of life to make me happy. Because we live in a world of great possibilities. There is so much available for us. We can run after that. We can run after what we would want to, re- to experience life to its fullest, to really experience life, get the most out of this life. Even as kids, we, we tell this to even the littlest of kids. We're like the moments we walk. We're like, go get it. <laughs> like you can, you can have it. Reach for the stars. Whatever is going to make you happy, run after it. And then what happens without even realizing it? What we end up doing is we end up being told from the moment we were born, go create your kingdom. Go build the kingdom that you think will make you happy. But it's not necessarily that the dreams that we might have or the desires we have, it's it's not necessarily that those things are bad in themselves. But what we need to realize is that whatever we desire the most will be what we serve. Whatever things we desire the most will be the kingdom that we live for. So to serve the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is telling us we have to come with a heart that is ready to say, I will give it up. God, God, this is, this is what I was dreaming, but if you want it, you can have it you, for what you want for me. This was my plan, Jesus. But if you have something different, I will give this up. I'll give it to you and you give me what you want. It's a, it's a way of saying, not my will, but your will be done. Because I desire you, Jesus, more than these things. It's not that they're bad, but it's coming with a heart that says, I desire Jesus more than these, these things. If he wants them, we give them to him because then we say, God, give me what you desire for me. Give me what you want for me. And this is precisely what the Apostle Paul, this is how he saw the Christian life. In fact, in Philippians, he gives us this little short testimony of his own story, of his own life, how he sees what Jesus is talking about in in Matthew 13. Look what he says. He says, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ. Paul is painting a picture for us. He's reminding us of the joy that Jesus was talking about in this parable. Go back to verse 44. Look again, something else Jesus says in the parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and he buys that field. Paul had joy, even as he's describing what he's giving up for the Christ, because he saw what was greater in Jesus. He saw something better in Jesus. 
when he saw that through Jesus, the power of death was defeated and that he could have life with God, it was better. When he saw that Jesus offered him a brand new life in existence that came with peace and came with comfort that comes in a relationship with God, he said, nothing else is better. When he saw that knowing Jesus meant being free from the power of sin, the, the sin that we, we struggle with, that we feel like we can't control, the sin that we feel like has domination over us. When he saw that in Christ, we are free from the power of that sin, he said, nothing else is better. I, nothing else even matters. I will give it all up for the sake of what I find in Jesus, knowing Jesus. But, but sometimes what happens is we read these scriptures and we look at what Paul is saying right here and we think, that's pretty extreme. Like, I wonder if maybe that was just for Paul. Because, like, Paul's like this superhero. Have you ever thought that before? Like, that's Paul. Like, he has, like, this way bigger calling than my life probably has. And so that, that may have just been Paul's calling. Does God really want me to give up my life? That, that, feels, that feels a little crazy. I mean, that's, that's farther than maybe we should be expected to go. But I, I think it's more familiar to us than we realize there's a, there's a line in traditional marriage vows. We don't necessarily say it this way, but it, it, it used to go like this. Forsaking all others, I choose you to be my wife. Forsaking all others, I give myself, I choose you to be my husband. And what we're saying in that moment is that I am willing to give up everything else that's there for the sake of now choosing to give myself to you. I will only love you in this way. I will only live for you in this way. No other person's going to get that. And, and then we have to consider this for a moment. I just want you to put yourself in this place. How would you feel if you are getting ready to marry someone and they were not willing to say, I'm willing to forsake all others for you? How would you feel? Would you be okay? Would you be okay marrying that person? Would you be okay with that commitment? Or would you begin to maybe question the sincerity of the love that they said they had had for you? Would you question the commitment that they've said they want to have for you? Because we recognize that when you, when you love someone, when you're, when you're ready to commit your life in marriage, we have no problem saying that it is a joy to give up everything else for the sake of the one I want the most. That's what we say. It's a joy. I'm ready to give up all these other things, all these other people, because you're the one I want. You're the one. And then at that moment, the commitment that we're making, when we say that, it begins to affect every decision that we make from that moment on in life. When I, was, when I got married, I could not make the same choices that I would have made as a single person. There was a new standard to which every decision I made now entered into my life because of who I had committed my life to. I had said, forsaking all others. And so for the kingdom of heaven, we began to experience what God is talking about when we're willing to let, willing to let every action and every decision, every choice, every relationship, even every conflict and every hurt, even the suffering that we experience in this life, when we're willing to see it as the opportunity that God is giving us to serve the kingdom of heaven. Because really what it means, living for the kingdom of heaven is, is living like Jesus. That's what it means to live for the kingdom of heaven. This is how we become a part. Hear this, this is so important. This is how we become a part of bringing God's kingdom to a world that desperately needs it, but doesn't even know what it is. Because if the kingdom of heaven is in our midst, if it's within us, when we enter the world with Jesus and we live like Jesus, they see the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom of heaven, it comes when we love people like Jesus loves people even those that have hurt us the most, that have caused us the most suffering, that are annoying to us, that don't treat us the way we want to be treated. We bring the kingdom of heaven. We're a part of bringing the kingdom of heaven when we give generously of our time and our money, sacrificially even, even if it's painful, because we see others as more important than ourselves. 
when we're willing to even change the definition or how we might define right and wrong ourselves for the sake of how God, our King, defines right and wrong, even if it means I give up a relationship, even if it means there are things in my life that I've been doing that I just will not do anymore because I want to serve my King. And the reason that we can do this is because we can absolutely trust that Jesus is a good king. Jesus knows what was, we were created for. He knows there is something better. And so when we serve Jesus, we also get to experience peace. He gives us the opportunity to experience peace in our lives that, that is bigger than anything we can understand or make sense in light of maybe some of the circumstances we get in. He gives us hope not only for this life we have in front of us, but hope for eternity, a life we get to spend forever with our King. And we're invited to experience a, a level of contentment that might be unexplainable apart from the fact that we know we have a God who's absolutely in control of everything that happens. And so I can be content in my circumstances because I trust my God. And not only that, we can be content because we have a God that says, I will provide all of your needs. And not only that, we have a God that also says, I want to bless you. I not only want to care for you, I want to give you good things. I want, I want to bless your heart. I want to bless your life. And ultimately, he's given us the Holy Spirit which is the means and the power to which we accomplish all the things that the God asks us to do as a part of his kingdom, we cannot do on our own. And church, this is just like a taste. It's just a taste of what's behind the curtain. It's just a taste of what is better if we're willing to take it. This past week, um, I, I read, a, I read a, one of the prayer requests that was on the connection cards that Chase was talking about. We read those prayer requests every week. We pray for them. And, and there was a prayer request that I read that as I was in this text this week and I was praying, I was thinking, this prayer request kept coming to mind. I just wanted to read this to you. It was simple, but it was beautiful. She said she was praying to find a community that loves and chases after Jesus. And I just thought, that's it. She's praying to be part of community of Christ followers that want to see the kingdom of heaven come to earth because we live for Jesus as king. Because he's what we desire the most. And the truth is, whether we realize it or not, we are all searching for this. Because if we're honest, we all know that there are things we are searching for in this life. There are things that, that maybe don't make sense and we're trying to make them make sense or things that don't feel right and we're trying to, to figure out how to get there. If we're honest, we all have this searching in us. But really what we're searching for is what we were made for. At the end of the parable, Jesus words it like this. And he said, again, the kingdom of heaven, it's like a merchant in search of fine pearls. So when he found the priceless one, the one like none other, he went and sold everything and he bought it. See, the problem is the, the, the kingdoms that we create and the kingdoms that we live in, they seem good. They seem worth holding on to, but they are complete and adequate substitutes to the beautiful creation, the kingdom that God is making available to us. But we have to trust him to see what's on the other side of that curtain. See, the lesson for our lives is that we have to remember that choosing the kingdom of heaven is, is not just a one-time event. Choosing the kingdom of heaven, it's not just a one-time event. You know, I remember when I, I first gave my life to Jesus over 20 years ago, I, I didn't understand all that it meant to follow Jesus. I understand all the things that, that I had that Christ was going to ask me to, to begin as he worked in my life, that he was going to ask me to give to him. I didn't understand the full cost of what it meant to follow Jesus at that time. But what I realized is that the Christian life is about choosing to live for the kingdom of heaven by the power of the Spirit every single day. It's a day-by-day -day decision to follow Jesus. Most mornings when I'm having my time with God, 
Sometimes I get more time and sometimes it's fast. Sometimes I'm in the road just getting going with life, right? <laughs> but there's something that whether I'm in the car, or whether I'm at home with my coffee, that I, 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 I pray regularly in those times. I said, Father, there's two things I know I need today. I know I need to be filled with your spirit. And I know I need to be led by your spirit. So that it's not about what I want, but about what you want today. Show me what you want and give me the power by your spirit to do that. And yet, if I'm honest, that is my prayer every day. I can tell you those days more days than I would want to admit where I choose my kingdom, where I choose what David wants. I choose myself. But the beauty of being a part of the kingdom of God, the beauty of what we have in experiencing the presence of Jesus in our lives, within us, is that then Jesus begins to show me. He begins to say, hey, David, you see this? And, and, and sometimes it's pretty easy. Like, yep, God, I see that. You are right. Man, I, I need to just, I need to walk away from that. But sometimes it's really painful. Sometimes it's something I'm not sure I want to give up. Sometimes it's something I'm not sure how to give up. But we know, we can know that we are serving the kingdom of heaven when we are willing to let God take more and more of our lives Every single day, we're willing to say, God, today, what do you want? What are you asking of me? I'm here. I give it all up for your kingdom and for you. You know, for some of us, this could mean like a pretty radical change of living. Some of you might hear this and you're like, I that's not what I thought Christianity was about. I didn't realize that's what it meant when someone says that they follow Jesus. And so it might mean just in these moments realizing, man, there may be things in my life I, I just didn't care about. And now and I'm realizing God does care. Hey, that's okay. Because God meets us in each of those moments. He's inviting us to experience his kingdom one thing at a time, one surrender at a time, one moment of saying, all right, God, here you go. One moment of saying, here, God, here I go. And so let the Holy Spirit lead you that, lead you through that. Let him give you that power. What seems impossible, there is power in the Spirit when we submit to Jesus as King. But then maybe for some of us, you know, you've been doing this Christian life for a while, but maybe we just need to let the, ask the Holy Spirit, what are the things I might be holding on I never even considered? Or maybe even you know that thing that thing you want out of life, that thing you're not willing to give up, that, that piece of, of, of your heart or your desire that you're like, I want to keep this. I'm not sure I can get what I want if I, if I give this over to Jesus. But wherever we're at in these moments, in this day by day, we want to hear Jesus. Will you close your eyes with me? I want to pray in just a moment. But as we begin to pray, I just, I just want you to consider this. It's something that I try to do in my own time with Jesus and invite you to have right now. Just picture Jesus in front of you. And then look down at your hands and maybe you can see that thing that God's asking you to give up. Maybe you can see those pieces of your own kingdom that you've been holding on to. And just hear Jesus so gently and loving Say, give it to me. Because what I have for you is so much better. Trust me. Let me lead you. I promise I will take care of you. Jesus, this morning that we, we need you. We need you not only to show us what we need to see, but we need your, the reality of the fullness of your presence in this place and in our lives. Lord, we want to be a part of seeing your kingdom come and your will be done. So Lord, whatever it is you're asking, we ask that you would continue to do as you have promised, faithful to show 
the work that you will do to accomplish what is good as we meet you in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be in the corner with some others. If you want to pray, we'd love to pray with you just as we respond to God.